obviously we're all computationalists in here, but not necessarily everyone has the same domain specialty. So the slightly more simplified title is how can we make really cheap solar cell materials? That's kind of the motivating principle behind uh, most of the work that I do. And uh, to that end, there's if you're at all plugged into the PV community, you've probably heard of the hybrid uh, organic, inorganic, lead halide perovskites that have been sort of storming onto the scene in recent years. And they're really surprising materials for a couple of reasons. And I'm going to go through that because it's pretty related to a lot of the work that I've, do I've been doing, although it's not, I don't directly work with the perovskites. So first off, um, these perovskite materials have seen really, truly astounding efficiency gains um, since, they've, since they've first shown up on the scene. So this is the National Renewable Energy lab um, efficiency record chart, which charts uh, the, the, record the record energy conversion, uh, power conversion efficiency of various types of PV technologies over the years. It's quite busy. Um, I'll highlight the perovskites are right here, these red dots with the yellow fill. And since they showed up on the chart, um, they've seen about a 9% absolute uh, efficiency improvement from about 14 to about 23% efficiency. Um, now, obviously, many other materials um, have, have seen that same type of jump. What's really extraordinary about the perovskites is how quickly they did it. So um, since showing up on the chart, um, it took them about 4.5 years to traverse that 14 to 23% efficiency gain. And if we just look at a few other examples, um, we'll see that that's really, uh, that's really remarkable. So a couple of the other, so some of the thin film technologies took closer to 30 years. One of the uh, silicon here, close to 40 years. There's one over there that you might have missed by eyeballing it that's more like 20 years. But it's quite clear that um, these perovskites were able to improve much quicker than anything else that we've ever seen. And that's uh, largely related to their uh, unconventional fabrication techniques. So they're made in a really unusual way compa compared to conventional semiconductor fabrication. Um, if we look at typical manufacturing processes for the types of high performance semiconductors that you need for solar cells, um, they're all, they tend to be high temperature processes. So this is a photo of a Tchaikovsky silicon furnace. Um, they're very high vacuum and they require really high purity. So you need expensive um, clean room facilities. And all of this means that making these materials uh, is very expensive and also very energy intensive. And that means that sort of learning quickly what works and what doesn't work is very difficult. And compare that to the perovskites, which are made via a solution processing method. It can be done at ambient temperature and pressure. All the precursors can be mixed and the processing done in just a simple glove box in, in a regular laboratory. Um, and the primary tool is, in fact, a spin coder. And I found this funny clip art of a very happy man holding a spin coder that I felt I should include. Um, <laughs> and so that kind of helps us start to understand how they've improved so quickly, because it, there's, a very, there's a very low sort of financial barrier to entry to, to uh, starting to do experiments in this field. The equipment is much cheaper. You can grow the materials very quickly, and that help, lets you learn very quickly what works and what doesn't work. Uh, but, the, but an outstanding question you might be asking is if we always needed all of this really expensive, high temperature, high vacuum, high purity stuff before, uh, how is it that the perovskites are so good? How can they get these really high efficiencies? Um, and if you're observant, you'll see that there's, there's a little asterisk there. Um, and the asterisk is a uh, other than the toxicity and lack of stability issues. So it turns out that while the perovskites have these very remarkable electronic properties, um, almost nothing else about them is actually particularly good for making solar cells. Uh, the, they contain lead, uh, which has a lot of concerns. People don't necessarily want something with a bunch of lead in it to potentially go on their roof or out the field where it might leach into the groundwater. And compounding that concern is that the materials themselves aren't very stable. So the perovskite actually refers to a crystal structure and the particular chemicals, the, the particular elements that achieve these really high efficiencies don't actually like to stay in that crystal structure. They tend to fall apart. Um, and so that's a big motivating factor in my work. We're trying to discover new materials that might sort of let us have the best of both worlds. So can we find a material that is amenable to these extremely low cost processing techniques, which could really revolutionize the PV space, enabling much cheaper renewable energy? Um, a big motivator for me personally is the problem of climate change. Um, and, but could we find materials that would also be non-toxic and thermodynamically stable over long periods of time? Um, nonetheless, um, we want to understand the physics at the atomic scale of these perovskites um, because understanding that will help us, hopefully, to discover other materials um, that sort of that, that let us get to this best of both worlds. And uh, in two words, the spoiler was already in the title, um, a big part of the answer to why they're so good is the phenomenon of defect tolerance. So this plot on the left is actually a plot from a pretty classic paper in the silicon PV research community that charts um, efficiency losses 
versus uh, contamination levels of various metals. Um, and this is, this is just one example. Um, and so if we take iron as a specific example, you see that you get about a 50% efficiency loss. If you look at the x axis on the top, it's at well under one part per million of iron contamination. Um, and this is a big part of the reason why we need these very expensive techniques to manufacture, uh, to manufacture materials like silicon, because getting them to that level of purity, and obviously they need to be more pure than that to perform well, um, requires a very high level of control. Um, Contrast that with the perovskites. This is from a paper that I collaborated with a lab mate on, uh, where he did essentially the same experiment in the perovskites, where he contaminated the precursors with known levels of iron. You see that you don't get the same relative efficiency loss um, until about 100 parts per million of iron contamination. Um, so the, these materials can tolerate a much larger level. In this case, we're talking about extrinsic contamination, an, an element that's not necessarily meant to be in the crystal structure. But it turns out that this is also the case for intr intrinsic defects, things such as vacancies, interstitials, things like that. Um, and so that's a really remarkable property. And that's what, we're, what I try to dive into in my work. Um, and so when we look at these intrinsic defects, the specific property of them that, that is really important in making them not detract from the solar cell performance too much um, is that they form shallow defect states. Oh, sorry, I had a little emphasis thing there I forgot about. Um, so a shallow defect state means that the state that's introduced by the presence of that defect, so if you're familiar with semiconductors, you know that the sort of perfect idealized semiconductor has this energy gap, or a forbidden gap it's sometimes called, meaning electrons or holes are not allowed to occupy any energies within that space. Uh, within that range. However, in real materials, there are these defects and uh, these imperfections that do introduce discrete allowable states within that range. And it turns out that when uh, we're thinking about solar cell performance, for example, how much uh, current that we're going to lose through a process called recombination, which is when a hole or when an electron that's been excited, rather than being extracted out of the device as, as current and useful electrical work, recombines with a hole, that can be facilitated by these trap states. And it turns out it's facilitated much more if the state is deep, meaning its level is very close to the middle of the band gap as compared to near the edges. And this is well described by shockley reed hall statistics, uh, which was established in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and this is a gross oversimplification, but loosely the punchline when we think about defect energy levels is that um, there's actually an exponential dependence. So the current that you lose from this defect-assisted recombination process um, is going to be exponentially more as that defect moves away from the band edge and close to the middle. And it turns out that in the perovskites, all of the intrinsic defects that are low enough formation energy to be prevalent um, have shallow defect states. So um, a big part of my work is looking at other types of materials and doing using DFT to do calculations of where these defect levels are and trying to understand trends across different types of chemistries and structures um, to see if we can understand which materials might share these sort of magical properties of the perovskites, but again, without uh, suffering from lack of stability or toxicity issues. So I'm guessing most people in the room have at least a passing familiarity with what DFT is, but not necessarily how you would do some, how would you do a calculation like this in DFT. So I'll do a very brief overview of that. Um, suppose we have a binary compound AB. Um, just think of it as a one-to-one -one compound for now. So it might look something like that in a, in a 2D idealization. Now let's introduce a vacancy of the atom B. So I've drawn a little dotted outline there. And uh, when we do our DFT calculation, of course, the atoms are not necessarily going to be in exactly the same positions as they were before. You might see a little bit of relaxation around the site of that defect. So we can let that happen. We can calculate the total energies of these two different types of, uh, of configurations. And when we want to go and calculate the defect energy, uh, unsurprisingly, it's the difference between those that's the first and generally the most important term in that calculation. So the equation um, that we actually use to analyze these results looks something like that. Uh, we have the difference between uh, those two, uh, the defective, a defective supercell and a pristine host supercell. And then basically, the next two corrections are essentially both just thermodynamics. So this is uh, the position of the Fermi level with the electrochemical potential. So in the defective cell, um, you may have more or fewer electrons than in the host state. And similarly for atoms, if we've introduced a vacancy, um, we have to account for uh, equilibrium with some reservoir of those atoms. Um, so again, that's just a thermodynamic uh, correction. And then finally, we need to compensate for supercell size effects. So it's generally not practical to simulate at the actual concentration of defects that we would be interested in, which again are on the order of a few parts per million. Um, that would be a pretty big supercell. Uh, I'm not sure even some of the amazing real space DFT codes would necessarily uh, 
that. But there are fortunately very well established methods to correct for the size of the, the effects relating to the size of the supercell. And I won't go into all the defects or all, all the details of that there, but they're very well described in this paper, and I'm happy to nerd out with you about them in private. Um, so when we actually want to uh, go ahead and calculate where those transition levels are, um, we, we use this equation, um, and you'll notice that. Um, so we're plotting now the formation energy as a function of the position of the Fermi level. And uh, if you look at the equation, the only place the position of the Fermi level comes in is through the dependence on the charge state. So these individual lines are actually really simple. They're just straight lines. Um, and so we do this computation. And then the way, that we figure, the way that we construct the plot is just by saying, OK, well, what's the lowest energy at any given Fermi level position? Um, and that's how we know what the, uh, what the charge state would be at various points, and of course, where the slope changes, those are our transition levels. So in this case, we have a relatively shallow transition level here, and then a deeper one that shows up over there um, as, a, as an example. So now that you just have a vague sense of, of what's happening in the calculations, I'll go a little bit into um, previous theories of the origins of this defect tolerance behavior, and then how my work has contributed to updating and extending those theories. So, um, how does defect tolerance happen? This is lead iodide, which we took as a model system because the uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide perovskites are actually, these methyl ammonium, uh, are the, methyl ammonium is an organic cation, and it sits in this matrix. Um, it's basically like a spacer in an otherwise inorganic matrix of lead and iodine atoms. So we took um, the ground state of lead iodide, PBI2, as, as a model system for some of these calculations, and I'll explain why that is in more detail in just a minute. So suppose we have this, um, a cartoon of a very, a very small bit of, the, of that crystal structure. Um, now let's imagine that we create an iodine vacancy. Uh, well, so the next picture is just that same structure with that green circled one removed. Um, the prior theory of how defect tolerance happens in a material like methyl ammonium lead iodide essentially was premised on the idea that um, when you have these defects, um, so if you remove that iodine atom, these bonds that we draw in these ball and stick models, we know in a covalently bonded material what they really represent is, char is electron sharing, right? They're, they're in these quantum mechanical pictures, you have these sort of clouds, and they're, they're, there's a different density closer to one atom or the other, and it depends on all these different things. But the basic idea is that there, there's, a, there's a sharing of electrons. And if you remove that iodine atom, we now have these three sort of dangling p orbitals, in this case, uh, off of the lead atoms. And the premise was essentially that um, the defect state that's introduced by, for example, an iodine vacancy should basically just have the energy of those lead orbitals, right? Because they're sitting there, they're no longer sharing their electrons, so they have some energy themselves, um, and, and that's, that's a new thing, thank you, um, that's there. And so that's where the defect state should come from. And um, I won't go into all the details, but the idea was essentially that um, the fact that in the perovskites, the lead is divalent, so it's a partially oxidized um, lead atom in the two plus state rather than the four plus state, um, means that that energy will turn out to be shallow or not even inside the band gap. And I'm happy to talk to you more about why that is later. Um, and, but of course, we don't like lead very much because it's toxic, but it turns out there are a few other, in, interest, as an interesting aside actually, um, the divalent lead form of lead is actually more toxic because it's more bioavailable. Um, so, there's sort of this double-edged sword where this thing that we think is m maybe what makes this, this material so special is actually part of what makes it sort of toxic and problematic as well, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but fortunately, there are other atoms that can do this thing where they go into this partial oxidation state and we think can give us this, this ele nice electronic structure. And of course, so there's, I'm sort of mapping out where in the periodic table those sit for you. Um, and of course, there's also thallium and lead here, which we wouldn't be interested in from an experimental standpoint, but we did look at some thallium and lead containing compounds um, in our research just to help us better understand broader trends. So I'll skip again to the punchline. Um, this was the previous idea, but it turns out that um, if you look at materials that just based on that criterion of does it have this partially oxidized cation, uh, you don't get entirely shallow defects. So remember that uh, if the slope changes anywhere near the middle of the band gap, uh, that's not so good for us. And you can see that that happens all over the place here. Um, as a brief aside to give you a sense for the sort of computational effort involved in something like this, um, to produce just this one plot in the upper left, for instance, is roughly 30 separate um, DFT calculations on order of 100 atoms, and typically multiple hundreds are approaching 1,000. Um, so uh, I know I'm running out of time. Um, we need to update our understanding. And basically, the crux of that is noticing that um, 
yes, you have these orbitals, uh, but they don't just sit there by themselves. Now they can sort of see these other lead atoms, right? And so there's an interaction that's going to happen. And this is actually a charge density plot from an actual DFT calculation where we can see that you definitely see this interaction that happens. And that means that the energy state of the defect is not just exactly the energy of that dangling orbital, but in fact, it could be some, somewhere else according to the strength of this interaction. So basically, we want to um, mitigate that interaction somehow or make it not as impactful on the electronic structure. And there are two basic ways we can do that. We can change the actual atomic structure or uh, we can change the energies of the orbitals themselves. These are sort of the two knobs we have to change how strong this interaction is. And of course, you can't keep the same atom and just arbitrarily change what the orbital energies are. So changing the energies really means changing the chemistry. Um, I will jump over this next slide. Um, and just say that basically, um, how much time do I have? Like none, right? Two minutes? OK. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, right. So there, were, there are these two ideas of changing the structure, changing the chemistry. Um, changing the chemistry um, turns out to be related to, um, in, the, in the native structure, um, how well the orbital energies match up. And that was sort of, we sort of got a hint from that. If you look at the cation vacancy states here, which are the red lines, you can see that they tend to get deeper as you move from left to right. And so that gave us a hint that when we're keeping the anion constant and changing the cation, um, many of these structures, as you can see, are not really identical. But especially some of them, like these three over here, um, are all like pretty similar structures. And the thallium iodide and indium iodide are about the same. Anyway, point being, um, you've changed this, this sort of energy, energetic alignment and are you, you're changing the, um, the cation vacancy properties. And so basically, this notion of changing the chemistry turns out to apply more to cation vacancies. We were looking at vacancies predominantly as kind of model defects, um, although we have good reason to think that a lot of this will extend extends to other types of defects. And then um, this, the structural aspect turned out to apply more to anion vacancies. So we found some cool uh, ways to mess with atomic structure to end up with shallow anion vacancies. Um, and I'm happy to talk more in detail with anyone afterwards. Find me at lunch or at a break, um, but I'm running out of time, so I want to make sure I have time to thank um, Blue Waters, uh, the Graduate Fellowship. Um, so I was an experimentalist for the first two years of my PhD, um, and I sort of switched over to computation, and getting this fellowship was like a great, in itself was sort of a great confidence boost for me and like very validating as a new computationalist in an entirely experimental lab with no sort of like reference points or anchors in any big way. Um, and um, so it was really great to give me that sort of confidence and also the, obviously the intellectual independence of having my own funding um, and also just a great community. So I can honestly say I've become pretty good friends with most of my cohort of fellows, a few of whom are in the room. Um, and. Uh, on the left are just a, uh, just a few people that I've interacted with at NCSA. The Chicago Blackhawk is meant to represent Victor. Um, I couldn't find a picture of you online. And there's a Blackhawk that has the same last name that kept coming up when I tried to search for one. Um, and these are, again, just a few people. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to really thank everyone.